Hello, my name is David Rowan. Uh, I'm an astrologer, but also a master practitioner of modern applied psychology, uh, which is an eclectic blend of NLP, hypnotherapy, and psychobiology, a field which explores the relationship between language and physiology. And I was in Wiltshire Health Authority uh, one day, explaining to the HR director that spider phobias are nothing to do with spiders. And he gave this kind of, what, sort of look, which I'm used to when they say such a thing. And I said, well, if you think about it, people who are frightened of spiders very rarely pick them up. You know, they don't like going anywhere near them. And he said, well, yeah, of course. I said, yeah, because, you know, very rarely you'll find a person who's frightened of spiders go up to one, pick one up, put it out of the window, you know, come back in the room, and they go, da, I forgot I'm frightened of spiders. I'm always doing that. That doesn't happen. Uh, people who are frightened of spiders uh, find that their fears are very reliable, and uh, they tend to go, see spider, <gasps> see spider, <gasps> see a spider. <gasps> it's, you know, it's a reliable mechanism they have. But how does their brain know that the spider is there if they're not physically touching it? Hmm. They're not, you know, smelling the spider, um, tasting the spider. Some people think they can hear what the spider is thinking, right? But that's another separate topic for conversation, right? No, what happens is, of course, the light in the environment bounces off the spider, shoots up the optic nerve, comes into the brain, gets configured into an equation, and then is uh, experiences an image. Boom! And the brain says, what is it? Uh, and it goes through a very quick comparison thing. Is it a, a mountain? No. Is it an elf? No. Is it a giraffe? No. Is it a pencil? No. And then it goes, oh, it's one of those. And then another emotional part of the brain says, what does that mean? And then the person goes, Ugh! Now, are they having the Ugh! response to the tiny little black thing that's out there on the kitchen ceiling? Or to the meaning that they attribute to the image? Now, if you're inclined to think that it's to the meaning that they attribute to the image, then the next, I guess, step in the thought process would be who assigns the meanings that you attribute to the things that you experience, you know? Um, and the only answer you can have is that in your brain, you are the person who assigns meanings to things in your brain, right? Um, now, what if whenever a person had that image got the optic nerve and their brain identified what it is, instead of the response being fear, the response was indifference. Yeah, so there's one there, so there isn't one there, so a little spine, so. Or uh, giggles every time they see one. <laughs> there's a spider. Um, or, re or relaxation. See a spider? <sighs> the zen of spider world. Marvellous. So in other words, what I was doing with this HR director was showing him that one way that we have of working in modern applied psychology is to show people who have um, fears of work or uh, anxious or stress responses to pressure, that the stress response they have to pressure is nothing more than that. It's a response. It's one of many responses that the person could have, but they've got stuck into knowing that that's the only one they have at the moment. And what we do over a couple of days in a training program is show them other responses. We talk about the biology of fight and flight mechanisms and things like this. So then they become aware that, that they have a, 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 a toolbox that we provide them with, different um, mental strategies of thinking. And if they apply one or maybe more that they particularly connect with, because different brains require different strategies to work with. Um, but when they find one that works for them, and they apply it to the idea of work, suddenly they can choose whether or not they want to be motivated or creative or indifferent, not care, or indeed stressed. Um, because stress is still a choice amongst all the other choices. And uh, this uh, it, it forms a large part of the, the work we do, looking at the stimulus response mechanisms that people have, the associations that they set up with phenomena. You know, for example, uh, <laughs> a woman in my village came to see me and she said, um, I've got a real problem with dentists. I said, what do you mean? You can't find one. I said, no, no, that's the problem. It's too easy to find one. Um, I'm so frightened of the dentist that I have to have, uh, you know, general anesthetic. I said, really? She said, yeah, and it's a real problem because I have to take a day off work. I have to be accompanied, so my husband has to take a day off work. It's very expensive. 
Um, I can't eat beforehand. I'm knocked out for a day afterwards. He has to look after me. Um, it's a real hoo-ha. And she said, I'm so terrified that they even have to, you know, hold me down to give me a pre-med. So she said, I said, well, I could help you that. She said, how long before a dental appointment should I come and see you? And I said, I don't know, maybe half an hour before we go off. Oh, oh right, she said, how long would it take? Ten minutes? Something like that. So <laughs> she came to see me uh, about half an hour before she had to go off. And um, I put her into a, a very light, relaxed state. And while she was in the light, relaxed state, uh, which was done in a particular uh, hypnotic way, um, I just asked her unconscious to imagine that she could see herself outside the dental surgery. And if she saw herself outside the dental surgery, to make this sound. <sighs> and as she walked closer to the doors of the surgery, to have her shoulders become relaxed, and her hands to go loose and floppy by her side, or if she's carrying a bag, just the free hand, loose and floppy by her side. And as she opens the door, moves in through the door, and smells the environment, if there's any smells available, then her breathing begins to become deep and even. And as soon as she hears the sound, zzz, go off down the corridor, then she becomes even more relaxed, and her unconscious will agree to relax more and more completely, all the while that sound and the entire dental experience continues. So she continues to relax more and more completely. And her physiology gave me a specific signal that I requested to let me know that it agreed to do this for her. And uh, later on that afternoon, her dentist phoned me up and said, you saw one of my patients. And I said, oh, yes, I did. And I'm wondering what's happened. And the dentist said, well, you know, uh, I only saw her for 45 minutes. I had a book to him for an hour and a half. I said, oh, sorry. She said, no, no, it's good. I said, is it? She said, yeah. We do all that work in half the time. She didn't even have the general anesthetic. Can you come and see me? So I suddenly found myself talking to a dentist and she was considering offering me as a, as a substitute for anaesthetic, um, which isn't really a compliment if you like to be interesting to people and you suddenly find that uh, they would rather just go to sleep when, you hear, when they hear you. But, um, you know, in the context, it was very good. And one of my students uh, one day in a class, and in, in the modern applied psychology classes, we're constantly working on ourselves and working on our own stuff and using these techniques to make our own lives better because... That's how you get to know what it's like for a client, right? And uh, one of these uh, students was rather kind of a bit, kind of, uh, I, I guess, reluctant to take on board the responsibility for everything that happened in her life. So um, she said, my, I've, my husband's got a problem. We said, oh, what's that? Let's help. And he, she said, he snores and I can't stand it. And we said, oh, right. Well, he hasn't got a problem. She said, oh, I suppose you're going to say it's me. It's my problem. Well, well, he's asleep, you know, he doesn't know anything about it, but you're the one who's awake, getting more and more cranky as the night goes on. So, <laughs> because you're tired and you can't sleep, and it just loops into a thing. So, um, I said to her, now, um, do you want to kind of make this easier? And she said, yeah. So, okay. So, just, uh, you know, relax. And she, she went into a kind of a light trance thing, and we embellished that a little bit. So, she was nice and calm and easily relaxed. And then I asked her to imagine she could hear the sound of her husband snoring, and turn it up, make it kind of, it's almost vibrate in the room, you know, just really loud, and she's getting all oh, irritated, I said, that's right, make it more intense, and now, stop, silent, and she kind of, she looked like she was waiting for it, you know, like, where's it gone? And then I said to her, now just imagine it's permanently silent. You will never hear the sound of that man breathing again. Suddenly she realised what I meant. And she went, oh no, make it start again. Okay, just return to the sound being there. <sighs> Sigh of relief, right? Because all of a sudden she became aware that the sound of his snoring is the sound of the man she loved with her. It's a signal from life saying, the man you love is with you. And all the while that snoring sound continues, he continues to be with you, which is good news, right, when you consider the alternative. Now, the thing is, just like a stimulus response, right, the sound of a drill can make you feel relaxed. Or oh, by the way, the dental lady 
um, I bumped into her a, a while later, about a month or so later, and I said, uh, how's it going? And, and she said, yeah, uh, it went very well. And then um, a year or so after that, um, I reported to her that I did the same thing with one of my students who had a dental thing. And the student in the class, said, a month later after the dental thing, said, um, well, it went very well. I started to fall asleep. We said, you started to fall asleep. She said, yeah, the sound of the drill was so relaxing. I just, you know, because the longer the, the experience goes on, the deeper into relaxation she went. And uh, this woman in the village said, oh, yeah, yeah, that started happening to me too. So this student knew that. So, um, and she knew the, you know, the, the technicalities of changing the stimulus to response and choosing the response you want. So I got her to just hear the sound of the snoring and asked her unconscious to be able to make the adjustments and changes it needs deep on the unconscious level to begin to have it so that the sensation of the sound begins to become a physical sensation that's something delicious. That's right. And the longer the sound of the snoring goes on, then the more delicious and warm and comfortable she becomes, such that it becomes something that makes the smile that lives in the heart of her feelings begin to glow. And she rather liked it. And all the other women in the room who were in the class leant forwards, thinking, hmm, we want some of this as well. So it's possible to um, not necessarily erase snoring from the world or have to, you know, take a have a, a Rambo action on spiders, uh, a fat one on spiders, <laughs> or, uh, you know, uh, just a, avoid going to a dentist ever again. Um, because you can take phenomena in life, and when you know how to apply language to uh, a person's unconscious, then their unconscious can reconfigure the meaning so that it becomes useful. You know, the sound of a dentist still exists, the spiders still exist, uh, the snoring still exists. But what they mean for the person has now become something different, and it's become something that makes their life easier, or even in the case of the snorgasms, something much more fun. So these are the kind of things you can do uh, with modern applied psychology, and it's, uh, it's a good laugh sometimes, it is, and it's very beneficial and helpful for people. Um, and if you have any questions or you want to know about this, um, you can write to me at uh, info at davidrum.co.uk, or just look on the website www.davidron.co.uk. You find all kinds of interesting things on there. All right. Thanks very much indeed for your time.